The book of the Revelation is a book that was written to advocate for the marginalized and the oppressed. If you don't look at the book from that perspective, you will not understand it. I mean, it's Jesus 101. Whatever you do to the least of these, you do it to me. It's Jesus 101. The first shall be last, and the last will be first in my kingdom. That, that the followers of the Lamb are deeply, deeply concerned about the poor, the disenfranchised, and especially the oppressed, those ones who are trampled by the four horsemen of the apocalypse of, of war and conquering and famine and, and death and sickness, those who, who have become victims of the dragon and the beasts that come forth from the dragon. Now, the ultimate expression of these are what we call martyrs. Now, in our modern uh, uh, vernacular, no one wants to be called a martyr. In fact, we've made it an insult. Oh, you're such a martyr. Oh, you're such a martyr. You're making a big deal out of nothing. That's what we mean. But actually, the term, the word, the concept of being a martyr for the early Christians, particularly in the first three centuries, and actually for much of the church today around the world, this concept of martyr, listen now, is central to the identity of what it means to be a Christian. And, and the term, the word, the concept is everywhere in the book of Revelation. This book was written to people who were being martyred, who were giving their life. And, and, and very often we think, wow, that's great, that's noble. Martyr is something I should think of someone else. But actually, we're going to see it from the text in a minute, to be a Christian means you are to be a martyr in the truest sense of the word. I, I actually met some people who to this day I'm humbled by and heroes. Over 10 years ago, I uh, went to the Middle East with um, our friends, Chad and Sarah, not their names, but they're part of our church, and they serve in another part of the Middle East now, and, and you can learn about them in the, in the Resource Center. They're incredible people. Um, I went and visited them. They weren't married yet in the country they were serving in, and in this country, it was illegal to be a Christian, to share about being a Christian, to have a Bible, and, and it was a death sentence to convert to Christianity. And, and while we were there, we were visiting hospitals and orphanages and all kinds of other things like that, followed by military police. But in the night and other times, we would actually sneak out and go uh, behind the scenes and we would sneak into places, we'd go on through back doors, and I would meet believers, people who had become followers of Christ when there was no earthly advantage in following Christ. Following Christ was not going to make their life better on earth. It was going to make it worse. And yet, they, they, they came to believe that Jesus Christ really was who he says he was, and that the way of the Lamb was the way that they wanted to live. They had found salvation in the blood of the Lamb, and I have never met more gentle, loving, happy people in my life, people who, who risked their life just to name the name of Christ. And of course, I was confronted with the reality of what does it mean that, that my faith in America is nothing but an asset? It makes me, you know, established. In fact, it would be a liability if I turn my back on my Christianity. That may be changing in our world, but it wasn't then. And, and I have to ask myself the question, even today, if following Christ cost me here in Babylon in this earth, in this time, if it cost me and it became a liability rather than an asset. That is to say, I wasn't following Jesus because he made my life better today. I followed Jesus because Jesus is Lord and he is the only means of salvation. If, 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 if that were the case, would I still follow? Would I still bear witness? Would I still be in the game? Would I be a follower of Jesus? It makes us ask this question, is there something we would give our life to and something we would give our life for? And the answer for every one of us is yes. Let's take a look at this thing of martyrs and how it expresses itself and what's really going on with that word. And, and what I want you to see, first of all, is that we are all martyrs. Certainly it, it's meant to be true of everyone who names the name of Christ, but it's true of all of us, okay? So, so we're all martyrs in this respect. We give our lives for what we love. 
We will sacrifice our lives for what we love. We will make changes. We will make change choices. Every time you choose to be something, do something, you are saying no to a million other things. And what you love, that is what you are giving your life for. Okay? So, so understand, we need to ask ourselves the question, what are you giving your life for? I mean, some of us are here in church because we want Jesus to make our immediate life better. And don't get me wrong, following Jesus, I actually there's incredible men of it. It makes our life better. Even if it costs us something in the short term, the trade of peace and joy and, and eternity. I mean, I get that. I get that. The Proverbs and living wise, all that kind of stuff. But, 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 but we have to ask ourselves, are we following Jesus for that? Or are we following Jesus because he's Lord and because he's the way of salvation, and, and we believe in the way of the Lamb. What are you giving your life for? It's amazing the silly things we give our lives for, and that's another sermon for another day. Because understand that we're called to be martyrs. So what does the word martyr mean? It's the word martos. Now, you may not have noticed it as much as you're reading Revelation, because it has two translations. Very often, it's 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 translated the word martyr when it's specifically talking to someone who gave up their physical life in death. But the word actually in the Greek means witness. And so any time in the book of the Revelation, in fact, most every place in the New Testament, it shows up a lot when you see the word witness, including in some of Jesus' clearest, most important teachings, is the word martos. So, so what's a martyr? It's one who bears Witness, that is to say, carries a witness, understands that my life is saying something. My life is communicating something. It bears witness or gives testimony with words, listen, but more powerfully by how they live and how they die. How they live in terms of priorities, what's important, how they spend, how they speak, what they prioritize, how they spend their time, and especially when we die. Because I don't know if you've ever been around people who are coming to the end of their life, but it really shakes out priorities. It really kind of clarifies what really matters. And it's a time of looking back and saying, well, did I, did I invest in things that matter? See, see, we witness in, in what we would die for, what we would sacrifice for. Temporary things are eternal things. So, so this is what it means by martyr. Let's see how the book where does look. And this is the big thing. This is the center of, understanding of the word martyr, okay, and the word witness. What we believe is seen by how we live more than any other thing. So when it says they overcome him by the blood of the lamb, that say we overcome the day, day, dragon by understanding we are in the blood of the lamb, we have power by the blood of the lamb, we are forgiven by the blood of the lamb, included in God's family, and the word of our testimony, our testimony is not what we say. It's how we live. In fact, if we are saying one thing and we are doing another thing, that is a testimony of hypocrisy that is more damaging to the glory of God and the witness of the church than anything else. And so testimony, witness, is all about how we live. Now, let's take a look at how this is used in the Scripture. Understand this. Jesus was the first and faithful martyr. Okay, understand that Jesus took on the, the identity and, and, and the, 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 the picture of what it meant to be a witness and a martyr. So this is how, again, way back at the beginning, the book of the Revelation starts out. Grace to you and peace from Jesus Christ. Look at this. The faithful martos. The faithful martos. This was Jesus' identity. This was Jesus' picture of himself, that he was saying something by how he lived what he said, and how he died. He, and look at it, he was called faithful witness. If there's one thing at the end of our lives that we would want, like, put on our tombstone, it would be faithful martos. The one who lived and died and gave witness, even when it cost them, even when it cost them a lot, even when they missed out, even when it took some temporary happiness and temporary comfort, even when we had to choose to turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, you know, give the person the cloak who just wanted the shirt, all the things Jesus said, we were faithful in that. Even when it was a long time, even when, as Revelation says, we have to patiently endure till the end. 
This is the, the faithful martos, and this is central to Revelation. The firstborn from among the dead. That's a picture of Revelation. The ruler and the kings of the earth. This is what Jesus was. This is his identity. It also was the power of the early church was seen in the martyrs. So watch this. So again, this is the early part of Revelation. Remember we talked about those seven churches? This is a, a specific example from the church at Pergamum of someone who was a faith witness. To the church at Pergamum, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. This is one of the churches we didn't have time to look at. Hard place to live. Lots of evil. The dragon is just in charge there. It doesn't seem like I got a good option this way or that way. It feels like I'm in a no-win situation. Satan's throne is there. He rules there. Yet you hold fast to my name. Yet you hold fast to my name. And you did not deny the faith, even in the days of a specific person, Antipas, faithful witness. Can you imagine sharing the designation with Jesus? That Jesus was faithful witness? And they called me faithful witness? Holy cow. I mean, there's just not anything you can say better about a person. Faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan dwells, where the dragon roars, where you were oppressed, where you were one of the victims of the evil and the dragon, the beast that come from the dragon. This is the power of the early church. Just understand as well that the history of the church is martyrdom. That is to say, people who gave their life for Christ. It says this in, in Revelation chapter 6. So, so next week we're going to really dig in. We're going to start looking at what are called the three series of sevens. And let me just warn you, this is the mushy middle part of Revelation. This is the hard part. This is the confusing part. This is the part you read and go, dang, what is that? And dang, what is going on there? And holy cow, that's coming or that's came or what's going on? It's the freak out section, okay? So next week, join us at Jake as well for the freak out section, Okay. You start unpacking that. We're going to start making sense of that. And, and it's very, very powerful. It's very sobering. It's very, very powerful. But in the middle of this, the first set of threes is seven seals. The first four seals are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And it's a, it's a story about human history. That human history, there are selfish conquerors who come and take. Okay, we could... We could uh, all right, I'm going to stop. Uh, to take, and they bring war to keep what they have. And from that war, because we selfishly use our resources for ourselves and for foolish things like war, it produces famine. And out of that famine comes unjust oppression that leads to death. And Hades comes with, that is to say, hell on earth. That's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's the first four seals. And then the fifth seal is about those ones who have been victimized, who have been beat up, who have been oppressed under that, particularly those who stayed faithful to the Lamb. Watch this. When he opened the fifth seal, he saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained. And so the first seals were, the first seals were like, the world's just a mess and horrible things are going on. And the fifth seal is, is the ones under the altar, the ones who have been sacrificed who are saying, what's going on? How long? And look what they say. It says they call out in a loud voice. This is a call for justice. This is a call of the oppressed. This is a call for right things, for people to be held accountable, for judgment. A big part of Revelation is about judgment. It's about judging evil. It's about coming against. Listen, God will not tolerate evil indefinitely. You know what evil has to look forward to? Wrath. Now, that's a big word we're going to start unpacking in Revelation in a couple weeks. But, but we want wrath against evil. We want evil to be thrown down, for things to be made right. For those who were disenfranchised and, and had everything taken from them, this is them calling out. Who says this? He says, they call a lot of us. How long? How long? We've been enduring patient, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. For those ones and these things and these institutions that have been oppressive, that have been evil. And in just 10 seconds of study of human history, we see this pattern, conquest and war and, and famine caused by selfishness and, and, and death, unjust, unnecessary, selfish death. It goes on all over the world even today. He says, how long? This is a call for that to end. Then each of them was given a white robe. And a white robe... We're going to see this in Revelation. Every time someone's being clothed in white, that is a reference to their righteous actions. It is, it is them basically saying, you stayed faithful to the Lamb. 
And everybody who gets a white robe, it's saying, you, you, you have done right. It's a celebration of righteousness. And they were told to wait a little longer until the number of the fellow servants, brothers who were to be killed as they had been, was complete. It says there's more to happen. There's more story to play out. And, and it's hard to understand. But, but stay faithful even in the midst of it. And again, we just want to say, well, why doesn't he just come and wipe out evil? Well, because if he wiped out all evil, none of us would be left. There are things in God's cosmic plan of salvation that are playing out that are just above our pay grade. But the lamb who's worthy to open the scroll, it's unveiling. So this is the history of the church. We're going to talk a minute about the destiny of it, but but let me just just say a couple names. So, So these are people who maybe we don't know. Stephen, the first martyr in the book of Acts. A guy by the name of Polycarp. Justin, the martyr, uh, uh, Sicilian, the martyr, Petunia and Felicia, uh, Potamus and Lucius, uh, Pothamus, bishop of Leon with uh, Blandia, and any others, martyrs in the cities of Leon and Vienna, St. Sebastian, and, and we could go on and on. We could go through the early church, and for the first 300 years, it was a story of people who gave up their lives. We could go then into the Middle Ages, and what was most tragic about the Middle Ages is that the people who gave up their life during the Middle Ages, with some exceptions, but primarily it was people who claimed to be Christians killing other Christians. So people who said they were with the Lamb, choosing the way of the dragon, and and killing Christians. Brothers and sisters, we could go all the way, and and I could list the countries even today. We could talk about Bangladesh and China. We could talk about what it's like to be a Christian in uh, 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 places like um, 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 the Middle East. We could talk about what goes on in in North Africa. We could talk about what it costs people to, to follow Christ, and we would understand that any time we would talk about here, us being persecuted or oppressed, I mean, we need to be a little embarrassed when we say things like that, okay? Because, my goodness, you look at uh, history, it's absolutely overwhelming. There's a story, it's an ancient story, and quite honestly, it may be uh, an apocryphal or not a true story, but it captures the essence of what's going on. The story is that a Roman official went to the Caesar who was killing Christians in the Colosseum. And, and he said to Caesar, Caesar, you must stop killing Christian. He says, kill gladiators, kill slaves, kill other people. And, and Caesar said, why would I ki- stop killing the Christians? They are annoyance to me. He said, because for every Christian you kill, a hundred people leave that, uh, that, that, that Colosseum wondering what they had to cause them to die like that. Because they did not die with curses and empty threats. They did not scream for vengeance of those who loved them. They did not curse. They did not beg. They did not whine. They sang. They prayed. They blessed their persecutors. And they did that. At times in early Rome when there were plagues, everyone ran out of the city. Christians ran in. They took care of their own and others. The qualification for being cared for is, do you need something? They took the good Samaritan as though Jesus meant it. And and this witness of how they lived and how they died, they welcomed in, this was crazy in the Roman world, women and slaves and foreigners as though they were brothers and sisters in Christ. So the landowner who was the lord of the manor, who had the villa, who was the male and could do anything he wanted, to anybody on that villa, his wife, his slaves, whatever, now was confronted with a spiritual reality that now he's supposed to love his wife as Christ loved the church, and he is supposed to, you know, uh, golly, uh, treat these slaves who he's been victimizing as brothers and sisters. I mean, it, it was stunning. And when people saw this, they said, what is going on there? And, and, and in 300 years, where Christianity had no power, no influence, couldn't pass laws, didn't have any guns, in fact, the early church fathers, without exception, were pacifists. They conquered the Roman world through love. 
the way of the Lamb. This is the testimony of the martyrs, and this is what qualifies them for the destiny that waits for them, and the destiny is to rule. Watch this. He said, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. So in the next spiritual reality, in the next new heaven and the new earth, there will be those who are given positions of authority that they have earned by their faithful witness. Okay, watch this. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They were lifted up. They had not worshipped the beast. We're going to talk about the beast. And, and here's the thing about beasts. A little foreshadowing. The beast come from the dragon. When the dragon gets power, beasts come forth. And the beast will love you and protect you and advocate for you. You will actually be benefited on earth from the beasts if you worship them. If you worship them. If you don't worship them, then all hell comes your way. They will attack and destroy and kill. And this is the test of the martyrs. Okay, so, so they worshiped the beast. They did not worship the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead. We're going to talk about what that mark is here in a couple of weeks. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. That is to say that, that there's a resurrection. There's a, there's a, a establishment. There's a new reality that the martyrs share. The second death has no power over them, okay? But they will be priests of God. That is to say, they will have direct access to God and Christ, and he will reign with them for a thousand years. And so all of this, there's tons to unpack here. We're going to get to a lot of it in weeks to come. But understand their destiny is to be with Christ and to overcome death and to be victorious and to be given uh, uh, the power and authority. So when Jesus said the meek will inherit the earth, he actually meant it. It wasn't just a sentimental poem. It was actually the destiny waiting for us. Now, none of this is new. It, it, it's as old as the Gospels, okay? John didn't come up with this in Revelation. Watch this. A call to follow the Lamb is a call to give your life for something bigger than yourself. Something that the Lamb says, this is what I care about. This is what matters. This is how you make things better. This is how you do business in the way of the Lamb. This is how you do politics in the way of the Lamb. This is how you coach and how you play games in the way of the Lamb. You are in the world, but you're not of the world. You have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb, and now your testimony and your witness is that you live radically different. And people will mock you. They will make fun of you. It's getting harder and harder to do it. And, and what it might mean is that if you're going to stand with the lamb, you find yourself in no-win situations where it's going to just cost you. And yet in the end of it, you just say, I'm with the lamb. This, again, is Jesus 101. Look what it says in Acts. So this is Jesus Right before he gets to heaven. Now this is, you know, he's, he's risen from the dead. He's been with his disciples for, for, for multiple weeks. And now he's going to ascend to heaven. So this is the last charge he's going to give them. The Holy Spirit has not come yet. So again, it's amazing they still don't get it. Watch this. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? When are you going to get this earthly kingdom going? When are you going to get Israel in the place? One of the things that's so stunning about the book of the Revelation is that John at one point thinks he's going to turn around and see the people of God. He thinks it's going to be Israel, but when he turns around, he's going to see it so much more than that. It's Israel. It's the new Israel. It's every tribe and every nation. It's spiritual. My kingdom is not of this world, but they still don't get it. He says, now's the time we're going to rumble. We're going to need those swords. Well, what's the deal? He said to them, and I just wonder at this point if Jesus didn't just go, Okay, I wonder if Jesus had to center himself. I just know he had to. Every now and again, he's just, all right, all right, okay, all right. He just had to settle down. I, I just like to think he was like that. Anyway, not that I'm ever like that, but he's like that. And he said, not like that. Anyway, I'm going to go to verse 7. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. He says, you're worrying about the wrong thing. And, and if I can just say it, and my apologies Sorry, not sorry. If your thing of revelations is guessing dates, look what Jesus said. He, he said this to the original 12. He said, it's not for you to worry about such things, for you to be predicting dates and times and seasons. So what are we supposed to do then? What are we supposed to be doing? Look what he actually says. But you will receive power. There is power when the church re-embraces his identity as martyrs. Faithful witnesses to the way of the Lamb. There is a power that you will not get in any other way. And it conquers armies. It changes nations. It converts continents. 
history. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my martyrs, martosses, witness. Right where you're at in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is going to go farther, bigger than you could ever imagine. This is the way of Jesus. And again, like we talked about last week, the temptation to say, oh yeah, I'm with Jesus, and I'm so with Jesus, I'm prepared to be like the dragon, to fight for Jesus, because Jesus probably needs me to do him a solid. Right? So I have to do some lying and some cheating and, and power and all the things the world uses to, to protect Jesus. Because if Christians don't protect Jesus, Christianity is going to be wiped off the face of the earth, right? And Jesus is going to lose. Apparently he didn't have a very good plan. So well, don't worry, Jesus, we've got your back. That's our attitude when we do things in the name of the Jesus like the dragon. Instead of the way of Jesus, which is witness and sacrifice. Verse 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if, this is another thing, and again, I could give you 25, 30 different verses about this principle of death as an identity for a Christian. Watch this. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after him, me let him deny himself, take up his cross. So we think of the cross, religious symbol, gold, pretty. For them, it was death. It was not just death. Tom Holland writes this in his book beautifully. It was a shameful, embarrassing death for slaves and traitors and the worst of the worst. It was a way to humiliate and pour scorn on a person. He says, you better take that up because that's your identity. If you're following me, it's a path of death. And we spiritually die. Paul says in another place, we die to ourselves daily. What I want, what I think important, what I think should happen, I die to that. And I come back to what is the way of the lamb? Okay? I want to fight back. I don't want to turn the cheek. I want to deck them. I want to get some power. I want to get some guns. I want to get some authority. I want to pass some laws. I want to get political. I want to fight back. I want to write a letter. I, I, want, to, I want to say that thing to that person. I want to do something to hurt them. That's the way of the dragon. And we have to fight that. We have to die to that and come back and say, what does it look like to turn the other cheek? And it's complicated to go the extra mile, to love in the face, to bless those who persecute us. To, to do good to those, to see that those people who we are oppressed by are enslaved, and they are the object of our love. The enemy is not the people we disagree with. The enemy is the dragon in his way, and you cannot fight the dragon in the way of the dragon. The dragon loves when you do that. He laughs. He says, checkmate. Fool, fool. You used my ways to fight me. Come on. Okay, and you rob yourself of power. Look what he says. He says, doesn't anyone come after me? He says, deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. For whoever would save his life, that is to find a life worth living, would lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will actually find a life worth living. In eternity, and even in this life. I, I tell you, those folks in Yemen, I don't think I've ever met anyone who had more joy. Anyone who just, they just oozed this thing that I just wanted to be with them. I couldn't even speak their language. They're translators. But there was just this joy. They were giving everything for the Savior that they loved. And, and, and man, I, I, I just couldn't even wrap my mind around it. And to this day, standing in awe of them, there's a part of me, honestly, and I don't know if this is good or bad, but it is, is jealous of them. You see, Christianity historically has never done well when it gets in power. When it gets power, when it gets established, it becomes something else. But when we are disenfranchised, when we are persecuted, when it costs us something, places like China, Christianity explodes. Uh, the Christianity, by the way, is not dying. It is growing, but it's growing in the hardest places on the face of the earth. And, and that's exactly what Jesus said will happen. He asked a big question at the end of this verse. What will it profit a person if they gain all of Babylon if they gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul, and that soul is the essence of who they are. What will, it, what will it matter? Or shall a man, what will a man give for their soul? What are you giving for your soul? What are you trading for? What have you said, this is worth living for? This is worth dying for? I'll name the lamb and get some fire insurance or go to heaven someday, but, but I'm actually not living for the lamb at all. And the idea of thinking of myself as a witness, let alone a martyr, someone who is sacrificing, I kind of came to Jesus so he'd, fill in my plans and make my dreams happen and, and bless me. That message is completely inconsistent with Jesus, New Testament, and especially the book of the Revelation. That, it, that our call is to advocate for the weak, <laughs> for the marginalized, for those who are persecuted. And we're, we're called to pray for them. 
So, so I, I want to challenge us this week. I want to challenge us to actually take some time to unite our hearts with the heart of Christ who suffers. One of the uh, things that, again, is completely lost in the American church is that perhaps the greatest point of unity with our spirit and Christ's spirit is not through worship or Bible study or even coming to church necessarily. It's actually found in two things. One, this unites your heart with Christ and makes Christ more real enough than anything else, is serving the least of these. Making things better for folks who just need to be blessed. That unite your heart with Christ. It, it is a powerful witness. The other is bringing your suffering to Christ. If you, you're one of those people, so you don't understand, I'm, I'm the, per, the beast has beat me up. I'm suffering unjustly. And, and, and I can internalize that and get bitter. I can just slink away. I can get nasty and fight, whatever. But, but here is what we're actually supposed to do. We're actually supposed to bring it to Christ and connect our suffering with his suffering. It's like two people who both went through a painful thing and they show up in a group and it's a group for that painful thing and they just look at each other's eyes and they say, oh, this person gets it. And, and it unites them in a way. And, and so we are called to suffer with Christ, to join our suffer. The Apostle Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, in for that, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit. I want that. And, and the fellowship of his suffering. That is to say, I want to bond with Christ in this suffering. And so, so, so we are going to do something today. We are going to actually have communion, and we're going to do communion just a little different. We're going to do it using an ancient practice of, of communion. And the reason we're doing this this way is very simply um, that we want to use words and prayers that Christians have prayed throughout the century that are praying all over the world and, and that, that we would be united with Christ who gave these prayers to hurting margin of and that we would be we would be we would be a church that would be very aware of our brothers and sisters and we would unite our hearts and begin a process of praying for brothers and sisters all over the world and so let's just take a moment let's open our communion and let's take out the bread and the element and realize that all over the world Christians are celebrating the Lord's supper people are being reminded of the life, the suffering, the passion, we call it, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now let's just take a minute to quiet ourselves. Just take a deep breath. And fix our heart first on burdens and pains and disappointments we're carrying, points of suffering anxieties we're carrying in our heart and mind. Don't deny them. Don't shame yourself for them. Just acknowledge them. And then become aware of Christ and all the rejection and all the scorn and all the mocking, the physical torment of the passion and the death on the cross, the separation from his Father. And in this moment, without getting any answer of why it's happened the way it's happened, Simply realize he has suffered too. He understands. Share his suffering knowing that he shares yours. And hear him say, it'll be a little while. Stay faithful and true to me. You are telling a story by how you face your suffering. You are bearing witness. And feel the intimacy and the closeness of Christ. And then turn your attention just in your mind eye to brothers and sisters right now who are meeting in secret, who are hiding away, who have to hide the elements of communion, who have to just have a page or two of the Bible that if they were found with, it would cost them everything. And, and unite your hearts in prayer with those brothers and sisters, those who are lived and those who, who died to preserve Christianity Centuries and centuries ago, who you are now here because of their witness. Let's begin with confession. Lord God, we confess that we have sinned in thought and word and deed and what we have done and what we have left undone. 
For the sake of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us for our sins, cleanse us from unrighteousness, and give us the power to walk in newness of life. And we would pray an ancient prayer of the church. Glory to God in the highest, peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and the glory of God the Father. Amen. And we are reminded from the Gospels that on the night that he died, Jesus took bread and he gave it to his disciples. He broke it and he said, this is my body, take and eat. And when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Afterwards, he took the cup. He said, this is the cup of my blood which will be poured out for you. It is a cup of a new and everlasting covenant relationship. And when you do this, remember me. And the people of God prayed, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And Lord, in my heart and my mind, I can hear brothers and sisters all over the world praying that prayer today. I can hear millions and millions throughout history praying that prayer in different languages, in different tongues. I can hear them turning their hearts that were broken and weeping under incredible pressure, incredible loss, and they stayed faithful to you. May it be so for us. If it costs us everything, may we choose the way of the Lamb. If, if it costs us our position, if we receive scorn, and they take our wealth, and they take our positions, and they take our lives if they heap abuse on us and on our children, may we, like the early church, count ourselves fortunate that we are counted worthy to suffer with Christ. May the witness we give, not by our greatness, but by your spirit, be an inspiration to the very ones who would take our lives, that they need you. May we really come to believe that your way, the way of the Lamb is the right way, that you meant it when you said love never fails that your example is something to be taken seriously, that you are the first faithful, true witness. May we be found faithful. May we share in your suffering. May we glory in it. May we just be overwhelmed. May we recognize that in this life, if all we get is we win in this life, we lose. But if we lose in this life for you and for your kingdom, oh, we find life. We win. Make this more than sentiment. Make this who we are as your people. In Jesus' name, amen.